Great. Interesting phrase. Good morning to all of you. My name is Asha, by the way. <laughs> I know most of you, but I'm uh, an unexpected visitor today. I live in Palo Alto, and I took the opportunity to come visit my friends because I wasn't scheduled there. <laughs> and so here I am with you all, visiting my friends here, which is great joy. Um, there's, a, there's a line in this particular reading, which I've heard for many years, having repeatedly for some 30 years done these services, and every so often we come around again. But he, he talks about the fact that Jesus was already listening and that God did not have to be wooed anymore in that particular way. And I've read that sentence many different times and it's, it's a very intriguing thought. And I, I think a very important one. Swamiji, when you study Swami Kriyananda's writing, you find that there's never a wasted word. Many writers kind of fill in while they're trying to think of what to say next. <laughs> But he never does. Every word means something. And what he's talking about, I believe, in this particular phrase, when he's talking about, I believe, if I remember it right now, Jesus talking to his disciples, that the door is already open. And we're already standing where we need to be standing. We don't have to uh, feel like we're lost in the wilderness. Uh, but what is required now is for us to move into a deeper understanding of that reality. Now, the fact of the matter is, we are never, we can never be separated from God. We are never closer to God or farther away. It's entirely a matter of our own perception. In the Festival of Light at the very end, it, it speaks of how we are all equal before God, all equally loved, not only Jesus Christ, Krishna, and great saints, but even those who have sinned most greatly. It's a very hard concept for us who are used to discriminating according to the values and the ideas and the habits that we have, that we see this world in, in terms of good and bad and effective and ineffective and loved and not loved, to actually realize that to God we are all equal. At a certain point in Swami Kriyananda's life when he was subjected to um, litigation and persecution in ways that were just patently false by people who, who were really evil, who had no good intention, but were just trying to destroy. And Swamiji over, overall was very brave in the face of it, but he was not without human feeling. And at one point he became extremely discouraged by the whole ugly spectacle and he prayed to Babaji, and his question was phrased in a beautiful way. He said, all the work that I've done, all the building of Ananda, everything, music, books, everything. He said, it's Divine Mother's work. I've never taken it as my own. If Divine Mother wants to destroy it, then I won't resist. That, that's her choice to do this. He said, but why are you letting such evil people be your instrument? And it was, it was a very interesting question. And after long meditation, Swamiji said, he felt Babaji answer, they are all my children. Which you just don't want that to be true. <laughs> <laughs> you really want to be on the side of the <clears throat> angels and have them, whoever them is, be on the other side. But if we are all equal manifestations of God, and if we were all on the same soul journey, God would rejoice at forward progress from any point that you're standing on. And, and that's, the, that's the hardest thing to understand, and that's what makes living in this world so difficult, living on a planet like this one, which is in a transition age, going up. I don't really know if it's better to go up or not, but we're going up. But we're in a transition between the age of matter and the age of energy, between Kali Yuga and Dwapara Yuga, between form and dogma into consciousness and energy, and that these transition ages are not simple. They're always times of great conflict. When we were disciples of Jesus, those of us who may have been there, Jesus came 500, the, the nadir of Kali Yuga descending was 500 AD. So when Jesus lived, he was fully self-realized. His disciples were as advanced as ever, ever souls can be. 
but the whole planet was low on the way down. And all that meant in terms of the disciples was that there was no point in really trying to build anything with society as a whole. So the entire attitude of early Christianity was to just withdraw. And the, they, they went out into the desert, they went off into the caves, um, they went into cloistered monasteries. You could just sort of wash your hands of society, which is why I'm saying that had its good points, you know, <laughs> of just really deciding, I'm just here for God, I don't have to deal with this at all. And some of us find that thought still very, very attractive. But what happened to us mm -hmm. this time, Paramhansa Yogananda incarnates, he's born in 1893, the yuga starts shifting in 1700 and really shifts in 1900. Your master was born just seven years before the start of Dwapara Yuga proper, in which consciousness, energy, light is rising and increasing. Technology, awareness, uh, globalization. I mean, if you think back to just 1900, everything that we have experienced, it's all come from then. And the masters have been making this happen. You know, all of us, especially I live in, in Silicon Valley, the fact that Steve Jobs had this relationship to the autobiography of a yogi, it's a very famous fact where I live, that it was the only book he had on his iPad and he read it every year and at his funeral he passed out copies of Autobiography of a Yogi. He certainly didn't participate in our church. <laughs> it wasn't like he joined and was active in that sense, but that man single-handedly really created a whole new reality for the entire planet. And he was right there with Master the whole time. Master was whispering in his ear. Dr. Peter Van Houten said that, let me see how this went. Master told Swamiji that the idea for antihistamines was an idea that Master had and that he planted in the mind of the scientist who then invented it. When Dr. Peter heard that, who, who as a uh, medical doctor, he remarked that that particular scientific discovery opened enormous doors in the field of medicine. It wasn't merely itself, it was also what it showed. And so the masters are participating in this world and moving it forward in all the ways, like it or not, that are required for this whole new age to, to come about. And so those of us who decided that this was a good time to incarnate, and one of my favorite expressions is, it seemed like a good idea at the time. <laughs> Decided that Master was coming, Swami was coming, we would come along too. And we would come along when you incarnate in a rising age as the second or third generation of a great avatar, you're not really here for yourself. You're, you're here because this is the right time and place for us to have the opportunity to serve. Master said he incarnated as William the Conqueror and uh, also as a Spanish king. And after some research, everyone has decided he was Fernando III, who was a Spanish king who was responsible for moving the, the Moors out of Spain and, and preserving that as a Christian country. It, at the time for the historical effort that was required, that was what was needed. As Fernando III, he spent 35 years at war, Yogananda did. As William the Conqueror, he spent a great deal of his life at war. And in our little minds, we have this thought, how could he do such a thing? I've heard many explanations, not the least of which is, but England, he, he established the country of England. England, even though you can criticize all these things now, became the force of globalization in the world. It was because of the way the English moved out across the planet that, that this one culture, which is the sign of a higher age, was able to happen. The language, the, the way of approaching, and just even the interconnectedness of it. You know, right now, a lot of what's being exported globally is not so nice, but what's actually happened is we are moving into one culture. Because in higher ages, you don't have all these little individual separated forms. That's the characteristic of a higher age, is that everything is unified. 
And so now we're mourning because species are dying and languages are dying and cultures are dying. And some people are just weeping about it. Some are picking up stones and rocks and guns and bombs and trying to preserve all of that. But in fact, there's this enormous cosmic force that's taking place. And because we decided to incarnate in this ray of divine consciousness at this time, we are also part of that movement of energy. And this is not merely a question of, oh, it needs to be done or anything like that. It's when you are part of a certain ray of consciousness, you have to attune yourself to that ray. It's not possible to just be in tune and refuse to participate. When I very first came to Ananda in 19, I moved in 1971. I was a, a, a Vedantist. I was very, I'd been uh, brought to the spiritual path, the beginning of the spiritual path through the writings of Sri Ramakrishna and through his disciple Vivekananda. And it was very, um, it, well, it was, it's a great teaching, but it was very, uh, Vivekananda especially, was very intellectual and very much not devotional, or at least not in the way I perceived it. First time I read Autobiography of a Yogi, I just, I tried to read Autobiography of a Yogi, I just put it aside. Too many miracles, too much Divine Mother, <laughs> you know, I wasn't for it. But I met Swami Kriyananda and I decided I'd better give it a second chance. <laughs> <laughs> but, but when I came to Ananda, I had this very purist attitude. And there was this community going on and Swami was trying to do all this work and he was writing books and he was going out teaching and he had this extraordinary willpower focused on this responsibility he had to bring this message to the whole world. But that was his thing as far as I was concerned. <laughs> I was here for self-realization and mm -hmm. I was skinny and I braided my hair and I had these little glasses. <laughs> I was really small <laughs> and really proud <laughs> of being so small. And one day we were driving through the community. Swami was driving his car and I was in the back seat. We were you know, driving over what were then complete unpaved roads. And, but what was there had just been scratched up from the soil by blood, sweat and tears, mm -hmm. mostly his. And I remember just sort of looking out the window and I was intelligent enough to realize that somebody's done a lot of work to make this happen and that it was Swamiji who was doing it and he was unrelenting in his determination to do it and I was indifferent. And it crossed my mind that I was perfectly willing to take from Swami Kriyananda but um, I was quite unwilling to give. And I gave in the sense that that time I was his secretary, I believe, and I cooked him dinner and I made him cups of tea and so on. But I wasn't willing to give my commitment to the only thing that mattered to him, which was Master's incarnation on this planet to bring the message of self-realization to all. And I just, it, it became a very simple matter in my mind. It was a matter of friendship. He was a man I claimed was my friend. He was working with everything he had to make something happen. And I claimed to be his friend, but I didn't care like that. And it was the beginning of a whole way of understanding attunement, really. And I'm a missionary by nature, and my zeal for this is legendary. <laughs> <laughs> and not everybody is of that type, but every disciple has to be in tune. And every disciple has to find out, you know, what is the nature of the path that God has drawn me to and the path that I am on, and you have to become part of it. This is our topic, self-reliance versus self-reliance. And there's another line right in this. It isn't just a question of drawing our strength from within, but it's drawing our strength from within based on the understanding that I am part of a greater reality. And, you know, this is the dividing line, really, in our society right now. It's not Republicans and Democrats and red, blue, purple, pink, or what all the things that people are talking about. Politics is like, like the thinnest little layer on top of this huge cosmic force that's really happening. 
It's are we alone in this universe and is our responsibility just to get what I can for myself and if I can take it then I should, which basically seems to be the operating principle of our society right now and the whole world. If I can get it for myself, why wouldn't I take it? Or am I part of a greater reality? Do I operate as in this sea of consciousness in which every action, every thought, every decision I make ripples out and, and literally defines creation? And is that power coming from inside and is it coming from the Master? The way Jesus says it so beautifully, you know, you're a branch, I am the vine. And the branch only exists as part of the vine. And once the branch begins to understand where its strength is coming from and submits itself, he calls to the, to the gardener, to the master gardener, allows oneself to be pruned, then indeed we bear fruit. But in alignment with that particular flow of energy, whatever that flow of energy might be, and we're, none of us, now you have to understand it, uh, I've recently finished writing this book about Swami Kriyananda's efforts to create Ananda, the spiritual legacy he left behind in all of this work. So my mind is full of, full of lots of little details. And in the late 70s, Swamiji started this huge outward moving campaign. For the first 10 years, Ananda was, we didn't even have any modifier. You didn't have to say Ananda Sacramento, Ananda Sac Palo Alto, Ananda Village. There was one Ananda, it was one rural community very isolated, very world unto itself. And, and we just, I thought we were just going to live there forever. Just this tiny little enclave of people enjoying Swami's company, enjoying each other's company, poor as church mouse, poorer than church mice. You know, just, but it didn't matter, none of that. Then in 1976, Divine Mother burned it down, a great deal of it. <laughs> and it just put us in a new reality. And Swamiji took that as a sign and as, a, as a, a, a counter wave to it, set out on two national tours and began to change the entire attitude of Ananda from looking into what we could get and how we can make our life work into how can we serve? Just how can we serve? That's the, the simple question. And for several years he was just on the road almost continuously and constantly speaking that way. And then this woman wrote, she was wonderful. She wrote, Swami said, I'm all for what you're doing. I'm really happy that you're meeting so many souls and telling them about Master and sending them back to live here. But I am a homebody, she said. I just want to be in my little house and raise my daughter and do my meditation and so on like that. Swami wrote back and he said, thank heaven for people like you. He said, if I can go out and tell everyone about the community, but somebody has to stay home and make it. You know, just like that. So attunement is not a question of what your God-given role is. It's a question of understanding that we are here to serve. And especially at this time on this path, you know, with these masters, this is a world-changing effort here. And every one of us has to be involved with our whole hearts and our whole consciousness because that is the quality of our ray. And even more than that, look at the world we're living in. Well, don't look too closely at it. <laughs> <laughs> I was saying to someone the other day, thank God Ananda isn't really popular. If we were really popular, it would mean we were being in tune with that world around us. You know, how could we possibly be popular? at that time. When, when Michael Jackson was at the very height of his uh, popularity in the world before the counter wave came and pulled him down as it so often does, the teen, some of the teenagers in our community were horrified to realize that Swami had no idea who he was. So they gave Swami some <laughs> recordings to, to listen to. And with an open mind, Swami listened to it. And of course he didn't like it per se, but his comment was extremely interesting. First, he said the man is a consummate artist. He is absolutely perfect. He knows exactly what he wants to do, and he executes it as well as it can be executed. And he's perfectly in tune with the times. You know, the message, the vibration, everything about it is exactly where the world was at 
And that's why everybody took him on. And Swami said, the more, you know, listening to him reminds me, speaking of himself, I am totally out of tune with the times. <laughs> totally out of tune with the times. Because messages like this do not come for now. It took 300 years for the life of Christ to really surface to the point where it became the world-changing influence that it really is. 300 years, that's a long time in the life of individuals. When his life ended, nobody would have thought he would ever have been heard from again. And even in the community that he was part of, those disciples then tried to, because it was Judaism, it was all Judaism, only much later did it become the Jews against the Christians. There were no Christians, everybody was Jewish. He was a Jewish rabbi. So his disciples tried to convert the other synagogues to the teachings of Jesus. And when they were rejected by their own people, they said, well, I'm going to have to find somebody to talk to. So Paul went out and started converting the Gentiles. But even Jesus' own people didn't accept him. And everybody was sure nothing would happen. I mean, any historical figure that's known from that time is only known because of his relationship to Jesus. Because the masters work on this very, very long rhythm. And it takes time. And we are caught right now in one of those times. And this is not a time where people can just sit back and let somebody else take care of it. And I, I'm not talking about political demonstrations or voting or politicians. You know, they're, a, they're placeholders. You know, they're not really causing anything. They have, the only position they have is because the cosmic forces need someone who matches that particular vibration to play it out, but they don't have any power on their own. But what is really happening is that the masters, the true masters and the power of light is working hard to transform this planet into a new reality. And it's not, let me, let me say it, it's not that we're compelled to be part of that, it's that we have an extraordinary opportunity to be part of that. Living in times like this is a fantastic blessing because it's not very comfortable, you know? And the greatest uh, temptation in life is to just kind of find a little spot, like a little clam making its space in a rock, you know, and then just waiting for the, the algae to come by, <laughs> you know, like that. And even if our lives are completely unobserved by anyone and look like nothing from the bigger perspective. God knows. And every time we turn toward the light, and every time we ease our suffering, our anxiety, our fears, I mean, I, I really can't look at the newspaper. I try as hard as possible to know nothing, because if I know anything, I freak out. <laughs> right? <laughs> Because it's easy to. But that very vibration of anxiety is the issue. I mean, on the other side, whatever side you're standing on, they're having exactly the same experience. They're anxious and they're trying to get their way. So those of us who know that we are part of a greater reality, that we are one with this great force and that we are all Babaji's children, and he's trying, all these masters are trying to find any pinhole where kindness and love can be given through. And, you know, much of our lives are spun, spent in very mundane ways. And it's, it's not a small thing everywhere you are. When you're buying a cup of coffee, when you're in the drugstore, when you take a an Uber car, wherever you are, love, 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 love as much as you can. Whoever you're looking at, huh, you're Babaji's child. What would he want me to tell you? What would he want me to give you? And it doesn't seem like much, but it's infinitely more than all of these politicians and all their conversations. They're just moving the chessboard, the little pieces around. They're like children. The real power is from these masters, and they are moving the world, and we are part of that reality. 
and we sacrifice. We don't get to live our comfortable little life. We don't get to just be with all our friends. I, I come here out of my long-standing, wonderful friendship with Dharma Das and Nirmala. I mean, we've had, and others of you also, and I speak of them because we've had unique experiences, where we were allowed to have these certain experiences in our life, but we don't get to cling to them. My best friends I hardly ever get to see. You know, it's just it has not, it's not our plan here to just get what we want for ourselves, even in our little communities. We have these wonderful experiences, but the, the, the single prayer, the only one that matters is how can I serve? And that's the one that will save us, will always save us. Swamiji says, what keeps you in tune is this constant expansion of willingness to serve. How can I serve? And no matter how small the answer, the size of the answer is not the issue because it's consciousness that changes everything. If every circumstance is, how can I serve? And that doesn't mean, how can I martyr myself and self-sacrifice for everyone else? Because that's not service either. Because then we lose. But how can I serve? I am the, the branch. You know, you are the whole vine. How can I bear the fruit that you want me to bear? And it almost doesn't matter what the answer is. I know someone wrote to Swamiji once, she had a very difficult decision to make, and it was a yes or no decision. There was no gray. She said, sir, I can't just, I can't figure out what to do. Either decision. He said, it doesn't matter. God is pleased that you're asking. Isn't that a sweet answer? We worry so much about the details. It's just like, this seems like a good idea, sir. I'm just going to try it. You know, live that way. Live with this constant awareness that I am just a tiny little piece of this infinite reality. And whatever I do, let me be a fine representative of my master. When Sami wrote this beautiful uh, course on material success, someone said, how does your, your, your course compare to all these other very famous ones? Swami's answer was magnificent. He said, I am the disciple of a great master. <laughs> and, and just say that to yourself I am the disciple of a great master or I have the good karma to be in the company of those who are disciples or at least I've heard his name I am in relationship to this infinite power I am Babaji's child and I am dear to him how can I serve? how can I serve? how can I serve? God bless you